Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to let this face mic ride, Chris, and I have this just in case. So if the mic goes down, I'll try this one. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? Well, yeah, yes, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the leaders here at the church, and um, uh, it's been a... Um, uh, all right, we'll just start. Um, it's been a, a, a mixed weekend for many of us. Um, I know many people in the room. I don't need to even know all the situations of everyone in the room. Um, but I sense this morning um, during prayer that the Lord is really going to do something unique in our lives today. So I don't say that to try to sell you into something. I don't make any money from this, just so you know. <laughs> right? I'm just, I'm just trying to set our attention towards Jesus. I'm trying to put our attention to the words of God that we're going to read out of Galatians today. And I'm, I'm praying, believing that these words will do a work in us that only they can do. I mentioned earlier that, that um, some of us want to have freedom. I'm one of those people. My hand always goes up when someone asks, do you want to have freedom in the things of Christ? My answer is yes. I want to have that, and I want that for you too. And sometimes what the Lord has to do is he has to untie some things inside of us to get us there. And, and we can go a number of different ways to get to that place. Uh, I, have a, I have a life coach, and I have a therapist, and I, he's a Christian, and we talk about Jesus all the time. And I, 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 we can try those things, and, and I do exercise. Anybody else exercise? Anybody love it? Liars, all of you. No one loves it. <laughs> Right? We try all the things to sort of like find like, like all that. I'm telling you, nothing has ever freed me more than sitting down with, with the Holy Spirit and, and with the Scripture and in prayer and just letting God do something. He, I sense this today. God is doing that today. During one of the songs that we're singing, I'm blown away at how um, it wasn't even the funnest song to sing. And don't, I don't hear, hope the band doesn't hear that the wrong way. But, but even while we're singing it, I'm like, it's so true. Like everything we're, on the words are true. Like whether your lips are move, moving and you're singing the words or not, your brain is seeing that there's, there's truth in the room. Is anyone? Uh, I'm telling you, like it, it, it's impacted me this morning. And I want it to impact you too. Um, but I'm not here to convince you. So it, it's like the Holy Spirit will have to do that. So um, what I want to do is I want to read the passage of Scripture that we're going to be in today. It's in Galatians chapter 5. It's verses 1 through 15. And Paul's going to make much to do about this thing called freedom. And so um, I will read all the verses together. If you have a Bible, you can turn along in your Bible with me. Otherwise, we'll put words on the screen. You can follow along there. But let's start here in verse 1. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, I say to you that if you accept circumcision, and if you're visiting, this is, we're catching up to a story that's already played out. I'll give you a little review in a, in a moment, but we're going to get to this. But he says, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. And I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves, we eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. But what does? Only faith working through love. You, Christians in Galatia, I know you, right? I, I know you. You're Christians because of me, Paul says. You were running well before, but somebody has cut in on you. Who has hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from Jesus who calls you. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. But I, Paul, have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers and sisters, still preach circumcision, why then am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Very strong words from an apostle to um, other people. I'm just like, are we allowed to t say that to people? I don't know. Um, it's in the Bible. Anyways, verse 13. <laughs> Uh, he says, for you were called to freedom. We read this earlier, brothers and sisters, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, 
but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in that word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But, verse 15, if you bite and devour one another like animals, he's, he's saying, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Okay, a lot of stuff going on in this. Uh, just to catch us up by way of review, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Christians in Galatia. It's a church, it's a group of churches in this area of modern day Turkey where, where Paul, um, years prior, had gotten sick on one of his journeys. And because he wasn't feeling well, he stopped in this area and the people in Galatia took care of him. While he was being tended to, he shared the gospel to him. So it does, here when I say this, when we think of people who share the gospel, we, we tend to think of evangelists who set up tents and, or maybe stand on street corners on boxes and they just proclaim all this stuff. Listen, you can be in a hospital bed proclaiming the goodness of Jesus. Amen? You can, you can have the cable guy show up on time. Miracles of miracles, right? <laughs> the cable guy might show up and you can share the gospel with them. But Paul is, is, right, is sharing the gospel to them. They become Christians and then he ends up leaving. He gets well and moves on to some other place. While he's away, he's caught word that other teachers have come into Galatia, into these churches, and they're teaching a false gospel. It's a gospel that's not the gospel that Paul himself knows. That is, salvation or acceptance to God is through faith. It's by grace through faith, right? It is in Jesus Christ alone. It's his works, not our works. And this is the thrust of Paul's letter thus far. And so he's been spending all of this time saying that those false teachers sh should be accursed by God, that they're going to face judgment for what they've done. But you guys know better. You know the truth because I'm the one who's taught you the truth. And so for the first three, four chapters of the six chapter letter or book that Paul has written, the first four chapters are more theological He's laying the groundwork for how people should think about their lives, how people should think about God, how people should think about salvation and acceptance to God. But in chapter 5 here and in the next chapter 6, he, he, he leans into application now. So this is where we put, uh, what do we say, where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where we get to walk it out. So what does it look like for us as believers to have faith in Jesus Christ, to not trust in anything else to save us, what does it look like for our own lives? And, and he spells it out in these verses. The, the pinnacle point for him, or the hinge point, in, hinge point, and everything that he's saying is freedom. Let me read it again here in verse 1. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Can we say that again? For freedom, Christ has set us free. I didn't do that very well, so let's all say it together. This is unusual. I know we don't normally do this, but let's say it. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So he says, stand firm in that. And do not submit again to a, a yoke or a harness of slavery. Paul has been laboring extensively into this idea that if a person is going to follow the law, the Mosaic law, which is what these false teachers are saying, you have to believe in Jesus and obey all the law. He's saying if you, if you follow any part of the law, then you are binding yourself to all of its requirements all, all over again. If you know your Old Testament, there were over 600, I think 613 Old Testament commands from Genesis to Deuteronomy, 613 different commands that a person must keep faithfully to be accepted by God. You can try to do that, he says, or you can have faith in Jesus. So if we're going to find freedom, then we cannot submit again to that yoke of slavery that is in the law. But what exactly, and this is the question that I've been wrestling with this last week or so, what exactly is freedom? What does Paul mean when he says to those first century Christians in Galatia, what does he mean by freedom? Let me hear me when I say this. He does not mean what you're probably thinking of when you think of freedom. 2,000 years have gone by since these words were written to that, those people. Hear me when we say this. The Bible can never mean what it never, was never intended to mean. Dang it, I'm trying not to move so this doesn't pop. So I feel like I... Uh, you don't care. I know you don't care. I'm trying really hard. I'm just saying. Um, but he's saying, that what I'm trying to say is like, for them, freedom meant something different. And what Paul was trying to say, it mattered to them. 
We have to struggle. We have to do the work. We have to labor in to understand what does he mean by that. And the first thing we have to understand is, eh, that's it, I'm done. I'm out. Pray for me, because there's nothing I love more than this thing right here. It's all good. So, but you guys better now? Okay, all right, I feel better. Um, in the first century, their idea of freedom was different than our idea of freedom. So what I'm trying to say here. Uh, so we have to do the work to understand what that means. Unfortunately, in our culture, when we think of freedom, like in Western, like America mindset, we think of the, the um, removal of rules and regulations, right? If I'm going to have liberty, it means that no one can tell me what to do. It becomes very egocentric. It becomes very much about us, right? What's the, what's the adage that we sometimes hear? Whatever feels good, do it. Right. And that's for some people, that's the idea of what freedom is. And I, I don't even disagree for some people that might be what freedom looks like for you. In the political arena, we might say this freedom looks like this. If the government would just get out of my business. Right. Let me do what I want to do. I don't need no regulations telling me how I can hire people and how I can fire. People. Like, right. All this stuff. Like freedom is like no rules, no regulations over me. Right. And I understand all of that. But that's not at all what Paul was driving towards. His freedom was not about the person. His freedom was about something else. Let me give you a real good definition of what we as Christians are free of. We are free from the guilt of sin because God has forgiven us. That's a real statement. And so when Paul is talking about freedom, he's talking about the shame and the sorrow that you and I would carry around with us because we're sinful people. Before we come to faith in Jesus, we have this proclivity to sin because we're sinners. It's who we are. And many of us walk around with shame and sorrow and guilt because of that. Listen, Paul is saying we are free in Christ Jesus because God has forgiven us. We are free from the penalty of sin. If you know your Bible, you know that the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. We are due death. Eternal death. Forever death because of the sin in our lives. But we are free from the penalty of sin because Christ died for us on our behalf on the cross. Amen. That's a freedom that Paul is talking about. It has nothing to do with whether or not you can drive 65 on a highway or not without getting a ticket. Anyways, we are free. Here's one of my favorites. We are free from the power of sin in our lives. Because the Holy Spirit now dwells inside of us. When we have faith in Christ Jesus, the Spirit comes inside of us as a seal of our salvation. And now the motivation center, the very thing that drives our lives, has changed. No longer is it you driving the car, so to speak, or navigating, but it's the Spirit of God inside of you. And our work in all of that is to yield to what the Spirit is doing in our lives. And in that is true freedom. So we've been freed from the guilt of sin, free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin. Someone say amen, please. Amen. And we are free from what the law, with all of its demands and threats, has over us. We are free from that. Or so we thought. This is the issue with the Galatians. That they knew all of this, and all of a sudden, false teachers have come in and says, no, 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 it's Jesus plus this other stuff. And this is where Paul takes an exception. That's not real freedom. The concern, I think, in the church of Galatia, um, for some of the Judaizers especially, and maybe even some of the other Jewish Christians, was this. is like, if we, if we get rid of the, the rules... If we get rid of the laws, then these people are just going to act a fool. It's going to lead to, some argue, licentiousness. Or people are just going to do whatever they want to do. Can you imagine like, what a life would look like without rules? Have you ever thought about life without laws or rules? Let's do two fun examples. The first is a sports metaphor. Um, but we're not going to do football or baseball because those games are terrible. Just throwing that out there. right? We're going to talk about the real sport that is soccer. Anyone? 
Anyone? Have I lost the room already? <laughs> All right, anyways. It's my sport. It's soccer, right? Anyways. So what if we played a soccer game with no rules? So we, the one team comes out, and they set their 11 players on the, team, on the field, the, the pitch, if you will, and they have their forwards, their middles, their backs, and they put their goalie in. And then the other team comes out, and they put 29 people on the field. And you're like, wait, you can't do that. That's against the rules. They're like, there ain't no rules, bro. This is no fun sport at this point. This devolves quickly into chaos and anarchy as people from the stands join the game to see who can win the game. You know what I mean? This is craziness. And think about, just for a moment, traffic. We've all come to that four-way stoplight when the power's out and the light's just blinking at you, taunting you. Who wants to go next? Anyone? Anyone? And we all understand how this thing is supposed to play out. You take your turn, Brock. You take your turn. Right? You let one person go, then the next person goes, and the next person goes. But there's always that somebody who doesn't want to wait, and they go with the car in front of them. Has anyone ever experienced this before? Any, no one? Right? So you're the guy, then. You're the guy that's no, no longer waiting around. We, we can quickly see how, how a life without rules or regulations or whatever just, again, devolves into anarchy or chaos. That's, that's not what Paul's driving towards. It's not, it's not the removal of, of rules. It's not, it's not even the removal of obedience to, to a higher a standard or rule. Paul, interesting, he, he speaks so, so much about freedom in verse 1. It's for Christ has set us free. It's for that. So stand firm in that. It's that freedom. But, but Paul also, in, other, in his other letters, he calls himself a slave or a bondservant to Christ. Does that sound like a person who's been set free? Would you call yourself a slave if you've been set free or bondservant? No, it sounds sort of strange. It's like this dichotomy. And that's the point that Paul's driving towards. Even in that line, for Christ has set us free, for freedom, Christ has set us free, stand firm in that. It seems strange that he would say, you're free, do whatever you want, but stay. But stay. On my drive in this morning, I was, I was thinking, I'm like, God, is there a way we can explain this? Um, and I don't know if there is. I'm going to try this sort of uh, metaphor. It probably won't work. I'm, I'm figuring it out as we go right now. But a p- picture a, a dog, one of those dogs that's on a leash, right, that when you drive by on your car or your, your, your scooter or whatever, they, they lunge at you and try to bite you when you run by or whatever, right? So that dog obviously is not free, right? Now, if you, if you unchain the dog, it's free, right? And it can run wherever it's want wherever it wants. Have you ever seen those dogs that are so trained, like even though it's not on a a leash, it sits right next to the owner? And when the owner says something, it goes and does the thing. Like when the master says, do this, do this, then the dog goes. That dog has 100% freedom. Don't get me wrong. It took a while to get there. Probably a lot of shock collars, right? (laughs) A lot of biscuits, a lot of positive reinforcement, negative. It took a while to get there. But here's the picture. That, that animal, that dog, has a relationship with its master with 100% freedom. And when the master says go, it goes. When the master says returns, it returns. In my mind, I'm picturing that's what God has for us. We're, we're not animals. We're way not, hear me? We're way better than that. But he's done something inside of us now that we can be unyoked from the, the bondage that is in this world and all the rules and regulations that, that religion and legalism lays before us, and we are now free to follow Christ. And when the Holy Spirit now leads us and guides us, we go and come when he says. Is this making sense? And then the litmus test for us, and I think I'm going to get to the verses here in a moment, but the litmus test for us is when we're serving one another in love, then we know we are operating correctly. Because the legalist, the one who's bound by rules and regulation, who somehow still thinks they have to earn their way to God, to strive their way into the things of God, the legalist doesn't serve other people in love. Why? Because they're trying to be better than them. They're striving to be better. At least I'm not like Mark, whoever Mark is. At least I'm not like that person or whatever. And then the other thing that they find themselves bound up again in this legalistic idea is pride. 
Because now they, they puff themselves up because look how, oh, oh my, look how awesome I am. Look how great I am in everything that I can do. And Paul is saying all of that is nothing to the Lord. Nothing. You know what matters to him? If you would have faith in his son Jesus. If you would believe in everything that you have been set free from striving to earn your way. That you've been set free from trying to be better than your neighbor. In fact, he says, once you're truly set free, you learn to love them just like you love yourself. Paul says here in verse 2, look, I say to you, stay, that if you accept circumcision, and this is what the false teachers were saying, that they needed to obey the law, and particularly they wanted them, the males to be circumcised. He says, if you, if you accept circumcision, then Christ will be of no advantage to you. He's saying if you accept that part of the law, then you got to basically take all of the law. That's what he says. In verse 3, I testify to every man who accepts circumcision, then he is obligated to then keep the whole law. I mentioned 613 commands. You could keep 612 of them and fall short of the one, and you're still guilty. Fun story. Imagine you get pulled over for speeding on the highway. Let's go back to this traffic issue. Right? You're speeding a little bit, the officer pulls you over, and you go, oh my gosh, officer, my bad. I never speed. I didn't speed yesterday. And all last week I didn't speed. And I'm a great person. I pay my taxes, and I don't kick puppies. I recycle. Oh my gosh. Like, I'm amazing. Right? And you could say you've done all the right things, but the officer is going to go, no, 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 no. You broke this command, and you're guilty of this one thing. So you have to get a ticket. He'll just push the, the, the thing across you and say, sign here. Thank you for your statement. Paul is saying the same thing, that if you're going to obey the law, you have to obey all the law, and no one can. And you find yourself, verse 4, severed from Christ. If you want to be justified by the law, you have, you have fallen away from grace. You have fallen away from the very thing that God has established for you. If you want to do that. Paul thinks it's foolishness to do so, but he says you're welcome to do so. You're just falling away from grace. Some have argued and used verses like this to sort of justify whether a person can, be, can lose their salvation. Has anybody ever got into that little dance, whether you could lose your salvation or not? I'll tell you what I feel. I think the Bible makes strong cases for both, that a person can't lose their salvation and a person can. Um, I'll tell you which side I'm on. I'm sort of on the side that you can lose your salvation, and we can debate this. Right? But I don't think you lose it like you've lost your phone or your car keys. <laughs> I think it's a, a choice that you make, that you refuse the grace of God and decide to go after it your own way. And, he, and just like Paul is saying, and then you find yourself outside of the grace of God. Is this making sense? So that's just extra. You can argue with me if you want. Um, emails go to joe at rendicator.org. Thank you for that, Joe. <laughs> so um, anyways, we keep reading. He says, verse 5, but through the Spirit, we eagerly await the hope of righteousness. It is the Spirit's work that makes, makes us righteous. That is so great. It's not your obedience to rules and regulations. It's the Spirit that makes you righteous. That's worth the price of admission. I'm just saying right there. I love that. And, and in, for, in Christ Jesus, verse 6, he says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. But the only thing that counts is faith working through love. He's not even saying if you've already been circumcised, you have to go through an uncircumcision. Is that a thing? It doesn't matter if you've been circumcised or not. The motivation behind it is what matters. He says, listen, if you haven't been, don't get circumcised. It's foolishness. And if you have been, don't consider it your righteousness. Don't consider it the mark of your covenant. In fact, if you know the, the Bible at all, the mark of circumcision is a part of the old covenant. It's the way that God worked with his people in the Old Testament. But there's a new covenant now, and that is the, the blood of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. It just means this, that God has worked in history with his people through different periods of time. You could call them dispensations or whatever you want. And he worked in this time with those people a certain way. And in Jesus Christ, things have changed now. And you have to know there's a demarcation point, And it's the cross of Jesus. That before all of this stuff, you were bound by the, the law. You were bound by your acceptance. Your acceptance to God was bound by those things. And now it's different. 
but it seems foreign to us that somehow God was, would change his direction or God would change his mind in this thing. I don't know why that seems strange to us. Don't we raise our kids that way? Where there's a season in life where we let our kids not do things, right? My four-year-old's not going to drive the car or put the grocery list together. I'm just saying. No one wants to eat ho-hos for seven days in a row. <laughs> right? So there's a time when, when they couldn't do something or where that's, that's the only thing they could do. And then they matured and grew up and, and we train them and teach them differently. Yes? That's my point. And God has done something similar for all of humanity. There was a season, there was a time, a dispensation when he was working with his people one way and then he's changed that. Is this clear for everyone? Is everybody okay with this? Eh, doesn't matter. But it's how it happens. I'm just telling you. This is what it is. This is what Jesus has done for us. Verse 7, he says, you were running well, but somebody has cut in on you, has hindered you from obeying the truth. He's using the metaphor of like a guy tra running track. He, he, like the thing, they run a lap and you're almost to the finish line and someone's cut you off. And, and, and you can tell. And he says, you were running well, but, but who has hindered you from obeying the truth? This is a rhetorical question, I think, that Paul is asking. He's, he he kind of knows who's doing it. It's these Judaizers. It's these false teachers. I think the question is laid out for the Galatians to ask them. You realize you've been, like, hindered, right? You, you realize someone's cut in on you, and you're not getting to the finish line like you thought, right? You realize you're, all your running's been in vain, right? This is the question. I love you. But what has hindered your relationship with God? Um, oftentimes when we are young Christians, when we first become young, not by, I mean by age, but like when we're young in the faith, um, we have a lot of zeal and we're very excited for the things of God. And over time, um, that can wane for us, that can dissipate. It makes me wonder what is cut in on us and is hindering our running towards the things of God. What has changed for us? Is that Jesus stuff real? Bro, why do you bring your Bible to work with you? Why are you always reading your Bible on your lunch break? I don't want to go to church this week. Can we skip a week? And, and you start, these are examples. That sounded random, didn't it? But these are examples of what I'm, I'm saying, that sometimes things come into our lives and they begin to hinder our relationship with God. And Paul has said that it's the Judaizers and them. And he gives this cryptic, strange little verse, verse 9. He says, a little leaven can leaven the whole lump. If you have no idea what that means, that is the strangest thing you've ever heard. I'm wondering right now why we don't have that on coffee mugs and sell them in the bookstores at, where they sell Bibles. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's speaking of, of, of yeast in dough is what it means. And, if you, and in the Old Testament, leaven or yeast always, always, hear me, described evil. It, des, it described um, sin. It described dark things, if you will. And he's saying if you allow... Um, circumcision and obedience to the law and all of that in one part of this church, it will spread its way through the entire part of the church. Just a little bit of this false understanding will spread and you won't be able to deal with it. But he says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, verse 10, and that the person who is trouble, troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever that person is. We don't need to know. Paul seems to know who it is, but it doesn't matter. I want, to, um, I want to pause real quick. I want to share something. I was sharing this with Pastor uh, Josh and Joe this last week. Um, so we've been talking about having baptisms next week. Is anyone in here getting baptized next week? Yes, let's go. Come on. I need some hands. Just let me know. It's all right. Um, it dawned on me this last week that we haven't done a very good example of explaining why we would like people to get baptized. And so I'd like to spend the, the last few minutes that I have with you here to explain that in, in, um, in lieu of what we've been studying here, you know, in companionship with this, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, 
I mentioned the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, you had your relationship based on obedience to the law, and circumcision was a mark of a believer, right? Because of Jesus Christ, we don't circumcise anymore for, for, for that. You can still circumcise, but it's not a religious reason is what I'm saying. So what we have now is we, we identify with Jesus' death and burial and resurrection when we baptize believers, so if you've never heard this story, picture this. When Jesus Christ was buried in a grave and on the third day he was raised from, from, the, from death, um, when we go into the baptismal waters, we're participating in the death of Christ Jesus. So it's a burial of sorts, okay? And so you, you find yourself, when you're baptized, you're buried into the ground. We won't hold you for three days, I promise. <laughs> and then when you come up out of the water... It's, it's symbolic of being born again. We, we baptize people who have given their, their faith to Jesus for their salvation. And so if you're, if you're here and you believe in Jesus and you follow Jesus, but you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to be baptized. But hear me when I say this. Baptism will not save you. So Paul's words, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, the same could be true for baptism. We could just insert baptism, whether you're baptized or not. But here's what happens when you do get baptized. Number one, we identify ourselves with Christ Jesus, right? Secondly, we're obedient into the things of Jesus. Matthew 28, he says, go therefore and make disciples in my name and baptize them. So Christians who get baptized were being obedient to him. And I wrote one other down. Let me find that real quick. Uh, it's the most important one. Sorry. <laughs> How did I forget? He says that you must remember when we're baptized, we're remembering what Christ has done for us. So next week when people get baptized, it will not be uncommon for people to applaud and shout when people come up out of the baptistry. Why? Because they know that this is symbolic of them being born again, and we remember when Christ did that work in our lives. And so baptism, I'm just telling you, it's a big deal for us. And I want to encourage anyone here who has not been baptized to join us next week. This isn't going to be the only baptism we hold all year, but this is the one, first one we've had ever in our building. We've always baptized people off-site and in other churches and stuff like that. So it's real exciting for us. So um, after service, make sure you uh, sign up for that. Um, and then I want to close these last few words um, with some encouragement. Right? Back to verse 13, 14, and 15. He says, You were called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And don't bite and devour one another. So watch out that you're not going to be consumed by one another. I mentioned this is the sort of litmus test on whether or not we're being led into true freedom. We're not trying to earn our way. We're not trying to be better than the next person, but we're trying to love one another. We're trying to serve one another in such a kind and loving way that it actually becomes a picture of what Jesus looks like on the earth. You know, loving um, others is difficult. It's a difficult thing to do. It's... Um, we say it's sometimes easier to love family, uh, and although that's difficult sometimes too, isn't it? But to just to have the ability to, to be so transformed by the Spirit of God inside of us that we would, we would be kind and loving towards other people. I'm telling you, if you're wondering, if you're, step, if you're living a life that is being led by God's Spirit, ask yourself, are you loving others well? And if you're not, there's just, it just a, a simple act of, of repentance. It just says, Lord, I've blown it again. Right? I didn't do that well. I didn't do that well. One of my favorite things of being a Christian is the ability to uh, apologize to all the people that I seem to wrong throughout my days. You know what I mean? Um, even last week, I'm apologizing to somebody because I didn't respond in a way that I thought I should have, right? It was at a party and whatever, and I was short with them. I didn't mean to be, and my wife loves me enough to say, Jeff, you're a jerk, and um, to that person, and I didn't even see it. 
until she showed me. And then I'm like, you're right. And so I went to that person and apologized for being a little short with them. All that to say, um, we, we, that happens in our lives and we just, we move in repentance and ask God to change us. Um, okay, I'm done. Uh, let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you again for our time. Thank you that you love us, even, Lord, in spite of us. Thank you that, um, that you know the weakness of man, that you know how we can do well for a short period and then we fail. And so you took all of the work of salvation off of us and placed it upon your son, Jesus. And then our work now is to just have faith to believe. So God, I pray these next few minutes that we would that we'd have our faith strengthened and encouraged. We thank you for everything that you do in our lives, Lord. We thank you that when we call upon your name, that you'll be with us. We thank you that regardless of what's happening in the world around us, that you are still King Jesus, that you are still worthy to be praised. And that when all hope seems lost, we can always turn to you because you will never leave us nor abandon us. And so we thank you for that, Lord. God, my prayer for our church is that we would, is that we would become a, a body of believers, a community of people who love each other well, who serve each other well, and that there would be no needs in this church, Lord. That people who need prayer would have friends that they could reach out and pray with them. That when difficult news has been given to them, that they have people that they can call to and have a shoulder to lean upon. It is my desire, Lord God, that you would knit us together to become the, the bride of Christ. That we would become so, so in tune with what you're doing that, that every person would be cared for and loved in this place. God, I pray for the introverts like me, the shy people, that we would come out of our shell enough to, to be known to the people around us. That we not just hide away. <laughs> that we, we expose the inner parts of our lives that we can have a real relationship with people. And I pray for the, the other people, the extroverts, um, that they slow down enough <laughs> to let the introvert talk and share. I just, all these things, Lord, I have so many prayers, but I just want us to come together united in Christ Jesus. And this is a work that we can't do on our own, Lord. It's a work that you have to do through us. So Holy Spirit, we give you free reign. Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd, you would salve the wounds in the, in the room here today, Lord, that you would come and that you would give comfort to those who need comfort, that you would give hope to those that need hope, that you would give, that you would show your love to those who have never experienced your love before. God, I thank you for everything that you do. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Thank you all. You may stand and we'll go back into a little time of worship. Thank you.